Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 38. Thank you for being here, and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons. Not only are patrons my favorite people in the whole world, but they can access the shows early and the outtakes that don't make it into the episode. If you want to support me and the show, please do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. If you aren't ready to become a patron but still want to help, the best way to do that is to tell someone about this podcast. Nearly everyone that listens is someone I've told about the show or someone else has recommended it to them. If you're willing to do me that favor, please tell someone today that this is a podcast they might be interested in. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to check in on you and your finances. And remember, I am wildly unqualified to give any financial advice. Check with your financial professional on what is best for you. Do you know how much you're going to put into your retirement account this year? Did you automate your payments to make sure that it happens? If not, did you mark your calendar for when you will add money? When money goes in the account, do you know what index fund it is going into? When in doubt, any S&P 500 index fund is the wisest choice. And currently, as of January 2021, The S&P funds with the lowest expense ratio are Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, State Street, and T. Rowe Price. All of them have an expense ratio of less than 0.2%, which is very low. And I'd like to point out that Vanguard is known for its low-cost index funds, but they are third lowest on this list which just reinforces that you don't always have to have what everyone says is the lowest cost because things change. To get this information, I used a fund analyzer from FINRA.org. FINRA is a regulator of the brokerage industry and has free tools online. I'll put a link to the fund analyzer and the ticker for these funds in the show notes and at artisticfinance.com. As always, I'll include links to everything we talk about on today's episode. Your homework is to make sure you decide how much you're putting in your retirement account, create a schedule for depositing the money, and decide what index funds you're investing in. Now what you're really here for, today's guest, lighting designer Ken Billington. He has designed more than 100 Broadway shows, has been nominated for 9 Tony Awards for Best Lighting Design, and won for the musical Chicago. Ken spent 25 years as the principal lighting designer for Radio City Music Hall, lighting their Christmas and Easter spectaculars. Ken founded KB Associates, Inc., an international design and production firm that has created hundreds of theatrical shows, television specials, and architectural environments. From nightclubs in Japan to theme parks to the Vienna State Opera to Disneyland's Fantasmic, his lighting has been seen across the world, and has earned him a spot in the Theater Hall of Fame. Now, we couldn't get everything into the show. In the outtakes, we discuss how Ken didn't go to college, his opinion on Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, which was Broadway's $75 million flop, a lesson he learned from Theron Musser, who was a pioneer of American lighting design, and how designers are artists and can't overextend themselves. You can find those outtakes over at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Ken Billington, to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. We are recording this on January 8th, 2021. We are amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We are amidst the Black Lives Matter reawakening across the world. And we're two days after a mob stormed the Capitol building of the United States. First time since 1812, or the War of 1812. I think it was 1814 they did it, but yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the world we're living in in this moment. <laughs> so Ken, could you give us sort of a brief recap of how you got into theater and where you are in your current career? Sure. Um, I was the kid in the fourth grade who turned lights on and off for the fourth grade play. 
thought that was fun and that's what I wanted to do. Cub Scouts ran the lights, you know, all those things when I got into the junior high school were combined. And this is in the suburbs of New York. I joined the stage crew, then joined the drama club and the community players. Always doing lighting, having great mentors there. Did not go to college, uh, got out of high school. Did, the day I graduated, I started doing summer stock for your playhouse. I was the electrician, became the lighting designer because uh, the lighting designer left. <laughs> Did a couple of shows. I don't think I was paid extra. I think I still got my $20 a week. But um, nice. came to New York. I went to the Lester Polakov uh, Studio and Forum of Stage Design, um, where my teachers were Peggy Clark, Tom Skelton, and Chuck Levy and um, studied there on Saturday mornings and worked around town and did that for a couple of years uh, and then uh, wrote Theron Musser a letter, said I wanted to be her assistant. I became her assistant at Stratford, Connecticut at the Shakespeare Festival, then went on to become her Broadway assistant. And at the ripe old age of 22, I stopped being an assistant and said, I'm going to have my own career. I assisted everybody in the business in those days. Um, assistants were not recognized by the United Scenic Artists. So I assisted. That's how I learned and started on my own, did an off-Broadway show. Then I got um, my first Broadway show, and I've done over 100 of those now. Then, you know, along the way, people asked me to do other things, so I did other things. I never thought I wanted to do architecture. Somebody asked me to do it. So I did television, I did architecture, I started doing spectaculars, dance, opera, whatever. I wasn't afraid, and I just did it. So here we are a lot of years later, because I started really young. You know, I started at 19 working on Broadway. So I've done a lot, and um, I'm really happy. Okay, that's awesome. I want to ask you about, you said you decided to stop assisting Theron Musser and go out on your own. How long did it take you to get to your own Broadway design, or what was that experience like? Um, that experience was actually a little scary because, um, you know, I picked up some odd jobs, and I was doing scrapping along and just making my rent. I had a roommate, so that worked. And then there was nothing, and I honestly had no idea how I was going to pay the rent at the end of the month. And I got a job as a projectionist in a movie theater in Manhattan called The Movie Musical. We showed double features of movie musicals. And I did that for a year because I didn't want to assist. I really wanted to get a design career. Then I got an, another assisting job, which moved on to something else. And some money started coming in. But my expenses were low and you know and and even when i was being successful you know sometimes you do a bunch of flops in a row you don't make a lot of money you if you're working regional and maybe the odd broadway or off broadway you're paying the rent i'm not saying you're not paying the rent but you're probably not saving very much and not getting too far ahead so um that comes with the um the territory but uh it never really bothered me. I may I don't know if I ever lost sleep over it. Maybe I did, but I just sort of did it. So you stopped assisting. You were working at the movie theater. Were you designing only in New York City or were you designing elsewhere? Uh, I really didn't start doing regional theater till like, almost, it was like the year before I got a Broadway show. So maybe I did get regional theaters, but regional theaters don't pay anything now. Let's go back. 40 years. They really didn't pay anything then at all. And I did things I loved and I had a good time. But uh, it was you really, if you were doing the regional theater world, which I think is still sort of true, you literally have to go show to show to show to show. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you had to pick one of your shows that you think is the most famous, which one would it be? Well, it would clearly be Chicago. So I disagree with you on that. I believe that Dolly Parton's Dixie Stampede is your best-known work. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> well, if you're somebody that goes to Pigeon Forge or uh, Branson, Missouri, um, and we have one in Myrtle Beach also, which has now become Pirate's Voyage. So I went to college in Springfield, Missouri, you know, a mere 45 minutes away from Branson. Dixie Stampede is what I live for. I hope you saw it after I lit it. You know, it sort of chugged along for many years, and then I lit it. If there were tons of par heads lined up like little soldiers, that was my show. Uh, and it's not called Dixie Stampede anymore. It is called Stampede. Oh, okay. I see. I see. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so we've put, we, we've put two of your productions up for grabs here. So some people, you can choose to go see Chicago. But my recommendation is to go see Stampede. You see, you see Stampede, right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, goodness. Okay. Could you describe your demographics to us? Uh, well, um, I, I, I'm a, a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. And, you know, um, I'm old now. So, <laughs> you know, you don't design 100 Broadway shows in a week and a half. Yeah. You yeah. know, but I started really <laughs> young by not going to college, starting working on Broadway when I was a teenager, probably shouldn't have been doing it, but I was, people took a chance on me that I was having a major career in my mid twenties. And by the time I was 32, I was, I did Sweeney Todd, you know, and it was, uh, it was a very different time. You must remember that the United Scenic Artists didn't even accept lighting designers till 1963. They didn't exist until then. When I got in the union, my union card is number 29, my union number. I was the 29th lighting designer in the United States cars. I, yes, I think there were probably 20 people taking the exam. And there were lots of other places to work. And there was Off-Broadway was a big deal then. Off-Broadway off didn't exist. Regional theater existed. People went there. All I, by the way, all I ever wanted to do was design Broadway shows. That was my career goal. I wasn't looking at these other things. I came to New York. I studied. I lived at home with my parents, so I kept the cost down. I had a car. I drove into the city, parked on the street. By living at home, when I would be invited to go to a, watch a load-in, they always put this on the board. Whatever show is loading in, uh, they're loading in Tuesday at the whatever theater. And you would go down and you'd hang out and meet the designer and hang, watch and just sort of be there. That's how I met people. It was basically, I was doing school on my own. I, I was picking up odd jobs. I was, you know, hanging some lights and building some scenery. And, you know, I would pick up some odd jobs to give me some cash, but I didn't have to pay rent. I paid the gas in my car. My father owned the car. When I was not in the house, if I was home, I ate for free, you know. Well, that, that's interesting because John Lee Beatty, he, he said he did it by accident, but he said one of the I think the best financial move he made was when he moved, he got a inexpensive apartment. Like he, he didn't really think about it. But then in hindsight, his roommates or other people he knew ended up sort of leaving the city because they had a more expensive apartment. And so your living expenses low is helpful. Right. And, and I mean, I needed to drive in. It was a 35 minute drive from my house to Midtown. And I would do that. I didn't complain about it. And I found out from the stagehands the cheapest places to park, where I could park for two fifty a day, or you could find a place for the afternoon and weekends or at night was free on the streets. So I, you know, I knew all the cheap places to eat. Um, that's how I did it. All right. So for people to get to know your creative personality. What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? Uh, well, you know, actually, you're going to laugh. Live event, I love production shows. What is a production show? Production show are big spectacles with, you know, a cast of 150, 70 of them being showgirls. So the Follies Bergere, the Casino de Paris, Jubilee in Vegas, which I did, but uh, Radio City Music Hall. When the Rockettes, 36 Rockettes out there kicking with a 36-piece orchestra in front of them, with the footlights full and the follow spots on, I mean, that to me is magic. I, I, it just appeals. Yes, of course, I love great shows, uh, but as just... I don't want to say mindless entertainment, but for entertainment value that puts a smile on my face, that does it. I know nobody's ever said that and you think I'm crazy, but... Um, no, I don't think you're crazy at all. Um, 
I think that's awesome. And I just want to know, what did you think of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark? Uh, by the way, the spectacle of it was terrific. It wasn't a very good show. Um, <laughs> okay, Ken, what is a piece of art that you love? I like it all. You know, old masters, romantic, I, renaissance, I, I think. I'm always amazed at it because of the use of light, you know, and how they cheat and fake lighting for great effect. Trying to duplicate that is always fun. And, and, and But, you know, then whatever show I'm working on, if something has to do, when I'm doing Sunday in the Park with George, which I've done on Broadway twice, <laughs> you know, you get yeah. into Surratt. And then you, and, and who was working around his time. There's a great museum in uh, Madrid. Uh, and I can never... Uh, uh, the Prado? No, across the street. Oh. Uh, the the Thyssen Bornmiz Museum. It is 13th to 20th century art, Renaissance to pop art. It is everything you've ever wanted to see. And it's all in one building. By the way, it's overload. So you can't, I mean. Right, of course. But yeah. I, I could spend a month just going to that museum every day because you can see pop art or you can see Michelangelo. What do you, they're just a room apart. Uh, so it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You see a John Singer Sargent and then you see, I, I mean, you just, it's all there. It, it's like a history of art. Now everybody has a destination to head for when they go to Madrid. Madrid, absolutely. You heard it from Ken Billington himself, skip the Prado and go across the street. No, that, by the way, the Prado is pretty cool also. <laughs> And New York City yeah. has good music okay. games. I'm not, uh, of course. Of what course. I like about that one, it's all in one building. So it's a very curated, it isn't like room after room of Renaissance painting, which is amazing. But then you say, oh, yeah, sure. Uh huh. But when you see a room full of spectacular pieces, there isn't another room of spectacular Renaissance art. You go to something else. Amazing. Um, Ken, what kind of music do you listen to? I don't. I like quiet. In my office, I usually have the classical music station on in the background, I think just to fill. My favorite time to design a show is Saturday afternoons to put the Met broadcast on. I haven't listened to music in years and years. I mean, I listen to music because you hear music. I'm not against the run. And then this all started in my 1976 MG, which I still have, did not have a radio. So I never listened to the radio in the car. My second car, which was a 1985 Jeep CJ7, didn't have a radio. I just got used to not having things. Um, if I'm working on a show, I listen to things. Um, I think when I was younger, I used to listen to cast albums, you know, and I would listen to the pop music of the day. But um, I just sort of thought, quiet's better. Wow. All right, so Ken, now your financial personality, are you good or bad with money? I think I'm pretty good with money. Have you always been good? I've always been aware of it. Do I budget? No, I budget in my head. I don't write it down on a piece of paper and say, well, my electric is $12 and you know, whatever all that is. I sort of know how much I have and I know how much it costs to get through the month. So yeah, I'm good with money. I don't know if I was always good with money. When you were growing up, did you have good financial examples to learn from? My mom paid the bills. My dad didn't. My dad uh, was an automobile dealer, so um, he worked and ran a company. All the household bills, it was all done by my mother. My father didn't pay the bills. I learned for her. You know, She paid the bills at the end of every month. I have zero debt. I have my entire life. The credit card bill comes in, I pay it. I always thought the credit card was me not having to carry money. The money is there to back the credit card, but I didn't need to carry money because the credit card would do it. It wasn't, oh, look, I have a credit card. I can buy $1,000 worth of stuff and only have $250 in the bank. I can buy $250 worth of stuff. So I just learned that from my parents. And I think we, we weren't rich. We weren't poor. We were just sort of middle-class folks. And the bills were paid at the end of the month. So... At the start of your career, what did your finances look like? But it seems like you had a soft exit from staying at home. So I guess maybe when, when you moved out on your own. You know, I was doing scrappy jobs. Uh, I don't know how much money I was making. I really was making enough to do what I was doing. But you take the three meals and rent out of the equation, $50 goes a long way. Yes, I, I could go to McDonald's, so that would 
take you a few dollars. But And also you said you your whole life you've never had debt, which is amazing. But you're also, right now you're in East Hampton in a house. Yes. Surely you didn't buy that house in cash, did you? I did. Um, really? <laughs> okay. well, so was, you never took a mortgage? It's, just, it's more complicated than that. Okay, okay. I bought a house I, with two of my friends. We assumed the mortgage on the house. We paid... 50% of it was cash. And of that, a third was mine. Okay, wow. Okay, so I, I want to try to unwrap that a little bit. So how did you assume the mortgage? Because that's not something people often do. Well, we did. I, I don't remember how because it was a long time ago. You, we assumed the mortgage because the mortgage was at 5.5%. And when we bought the house, mortgages were about 9 or 10%. Yeah. And went up to like 18% at some one point. For anybody that doesn't know, assuming a mortgage means somebody has the house and has a mortgage. Instead of somebody getting a new mortgage for the house, they just swap in their name and start paying the mortgage as is. Yes. We went to the bank and they took whoever's name was on it and put our three names on it. And we started paying the mortgage. And then my partners passed away and I inherited their part of the house. I kept paying the mortgage. And then one day it was done. And the mortgage payment was $233 a month. So, yeah, that was a, a little bit of debt, but not. A little bit of debt. That's very small. That's a very small mortgage. <laughs> and I do have a debt. When I was doing well in the 70s, I didn't pay any income tax for three years. <laughs> I just was so busy. Yeah. I didn't have an accountant. I didn't have a business manager. I had nothing. I had me. And I was running from theater to theater, lighting shows. I knew how much money was in the bank. It was enough money in the bank. Oh, taxes are done. This is before computers. So you're looking at a stack of papers. And now I'm going to need to take a week to figure this out. And I wasn't terribly good with, it, you know, putting receipts here, though I would put my receipts in and get money, but probably didn't keep a copy of the receipts. You know, I would give them money and they would give me a check. I mean, so I didn't keep track of all that. And plenty of money in the bank. So zipping along. And after three years, I said, you know, somebody's going to come find me at some point. So I got to pay my taxes. Got a, an accountant that did some theater people. I went and saw her and went with bags of stuff. She didn't comment on my fact that I hadn't done any of this. We just said, okay, let's solve this. Left her everything. A time later, she came to me and said, you owe this much money. Sign these and send in these checks. And by the way, I had the money to do that. So I signed the tax forms for year one, two, and three and sent in what was owed on that. A lot of it in 1099. Some of it had been withheld. It was a mishmash of stuff. And I said, oh, that was easy. She said, oh, yeah. Well, they will send you the bill for penalties and the interest. I said, oh. And she said, and that bill is due when you get it. And I said, all right. Well, all of a sudden, I got a bill. I think it was for about $30,000. I did not have $30,000. You might as well have said $2 million at that point to me. I had money in the bank. I had some stock. I had savings. I took all of that out. I, I wiped myself out. I still had a chunk of change. And it was in those days where they sent you credit cards in the mail. I took all of them and took cash advances on them. Many, many thousands of dollars. This is a terrible story. Cash advances on those credit cards to pay. And by the way, they all didn't come at once. They came like weeks apart, but I, it was a lot of money. That left me with paying that 18% or whatever that awful interest rate is to credit card companies, which I started paying because I was making money. I was working. I just didn't have it. I think I borrowed against my life insurance. I mean, that was all of that. And I paid it. And I said, okay, stupid Ken, we're never doing that again. I got a business manager within a week and have never had any debt since. And by the way, it took a while to pay off the credit card. That is an amazing story. <laughs> okay, so you didn't pay taxes for three years. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just processing all of this. Yeah. Um, okay, and the taking the cash advances, especially because you said, I never 
put money on the credit cards. You taking all those cash advances from the credit cards stresses like my my. Even though this was five decades ago, my heart is <laughs> racing. Yeah, yeah, and, but I did, and we paid it back. And you know, and the other thing, when I was eighteen, nineteen. Leslie Ogden ran the Community Players, who was in the insurance business. He's the one who found me, Lester Polakovs, and all of that. And he said, you need life insurance. And I said, life insurance? I was like 19. And he said, it's cheap when you're your age. It's forced savings, and you can borrow against it. So I got a life insurance policy. I honestly have no idea what it cost. It wasn't a lot of money. And it was like a $42,000 life insurance policy. So I got that. And then the following year, he said to me, we're going to get you a major medical policy. Again, you're young. You're cheap. I think I had to pay the first $3,000 or something, which I figured I could always find. But then it was up to like $100,000. And it was cheap. Because there was no health insurance. If I wasn't in the union, I didn't health health insurance. Yeah, you don't get sick when you're young, but sometimes you fall and break your arm. Who knows? Or get hit by a bus or you get really sick with something else. Leslie was really smart this way. And it was a number that didn't hurt me financially. I just knew I had these two expenses. Probably in a year was $1,200 or something or maybe $1,500 a year. The life insurance built and built. And when you have a life insurance policy, you can borrow against it. And when you borrow against it, you pay the interest. But it's there. It's your money. So you need $1,000. I can borrow $1,000 from my life insurance, and the interest rate is pretty low. Life insurance at that part of time in my life was spectacular to have and bailed me out. This, that's an interesting thing. You're the first person to sort of mention this life insurance, especially for younger people. So this is going to have to be something I look into. And it's cheap. When you're young, you're not going to die. So the life insurance is cheap. If you try and get it when you're 50, it's expensive. On a daily basis, do you think about money or do you worry about money? No, I don't. I just I don't know if I ever have. I sort of know what I have and I know what I can do. I'm going to say I need a new car and a car costs $30,000, then I say, do I have $30,000 in the bank? Because I would never buy it on credit. Your aversion to credit and debt, is that because you didn't pay your taxes and you had to take those credit card advances? Yes, absolutely. Were you like 30-ish when that happened? Oh, I was in my, I was in my, I was in my 20s. Okay, so that's, in, in a way, that's a good time for that to happen. Yeah. That set you up for credit aversion. <laughs> And another thing you mentioned was the business manager. You, it's the same thing with taxes and I guess business managers, but enough people on this podcast have said, get one, pay for one. They're smarter at it than you are. And they're just worth it for your, for everything. Right. And, and there's a very different thing. You know, there's managers, which artists have managers who take a percentage of their income. I have a business manager is paid hourly to come to my office, pays all the bills, does all the billing handles the money, does all the bookkeeping, sends everything to the accountants. So I don't have to sit there and sign checks. I know how much money's in the bank. I know what's going on, but I don't actually deal with it all. And he's the one who, you know, Douglas would say to me, we're getting pretty low in the accounts. And then I'd say, oh, but I have a Dixie Stampede coming up and that's going to be this amount of money. He said, oh, that'll cover us fine. Or he would turn to me and say, you know, we haven't gotten the royalties from the show or somebody's not paying their bills or we didn't get the reimbursement. And then I would write a note, you know, and usually, honestly, I don't know if I was screwed more than two or three times out of money from people in the business. Um, it, it got put to the bottom of the stack is usually what it was. You know how our emails now go to the bottom of the stack, but when you would get a bill, it would just get put and they go, oh, sorry, Ken, sorry. Artists and freelancers have to keep track of who owes them money. It's not because people are trying not to pay us. It's truly that everybody is busy, even a big show. They may just be behind, but you have to sometimes reach out. But it's not, there's nothing malicious usually. It's very rare. Right. The other thing I found was expenses. You're doing a show. They've just run out of some gel. You say to your assistant, you give them $20, run over to the store and buy a sheet of whatever. 
and they come back and they give you the receipt and the change. If you don't write that down and put it in the stack, you can get nickeled and dimed out of thousands of dollars. By the way, the producer will pay for it. The production will pay for that piece of gel. They're not worried about it. If I don't put the bill in for whatever that cost is, you're not going to get reimbursed. So you got to keep track of all the expenses. When I drive up to the scene shop to look at the scenery, I have a car, so I don't charge for my car, but I charge for the gas and the tolls. Yeah, the toll is $6 and and the big deal, but you know, all of a sudden $6 here, $6 there on one production adds up. Getting all the receipts into one pile so the business manager could bill the expenses. The other thing I learned is you have to get your expense bill in a week before the show opens. Oh, I have only $50 worth of expenses. There's another 25 coming in this week. Bill the $50. It gets harder after opening night to get the money. A show has two budgets. That's the budget to open it. And then there's the operating budget. So they have a set amount of money to open the show. That money is there to be spent on everything to get the show to opening night and covering losses and fees and scenery and rentals and coffee for the crew. That money is there to be spent. But on of opening night, that money is now finished. We are now into the operating budget. You got to sell the tickets to pay the bills. And if you don't sell the tickets, you can't pay the bills and the show closes. So if I send in my bill after opening, they may have gone through all the production budget, or there may only be a little money left in it, but they're not selling any tickets. So all of a sudden that money got moved over to cover operating losses. So the last thing they want to do, the manager can do is pay your $50 expense bill. They probably will pay it at some point, but probably not promptly. So I always get the bill in a week before the show opens. And if I'm really good, I go to the theater, I hand it to the company manager, and the check will be there the next day. Nice. All right. Good to know. Good to know. What is the best financial decision that you've ever made? Business manager. Business manager. And the other next one was uh, forming a corporation. Forming a corporation. Oh, you know, I guess we should take this moment to tell people that you have a what do you call it? A design studio? I'm, I'm a corporation. I'm a proper KB Associates, Inc. The August Wilson Theater, fourth floor is my office. Before that, I had an office and I had five apartments in an apartment building on 70th Street. And just to tease a future episode that we haven't recorded yet, but we are going to do an episode with you and with John Lee Beatty, because John Lee Beatty, you guys have, mm, your, your careers go in parallel a little bit, uh, but he's sort of a one-man show and you formed a corporation. Right. And so we're going to talk about finances and taxes and how that's all different from that regard. So we don't have to get too much into that today, other than how it does you know, apply to you, which today is, you're saying it's one of the best financial decisions you've ever made. Well, at the end of the day, I get one paycheck a year from my corporation. So if I am hired to design a Broadway show, to design any show, the contract is with my corporation. It would be KB Associates, FSO, for the services of Ken Billington. Some of them, it's just with KBA. So all the money goes to the corporation. It doesn't go to me. I own the corporation. At the end of the year, the, I get a salary from my corporation. If the corporation doesn't do very well, I get less money. If the corporation does well, I make more money. By having a corporation, then that lets me have a corporate pension plan. So I can have my SEP IRA, I have Roth IRAs, I have SEP IRAs. The corporation is paying it. It's all my money, by the way. And the government's getting all their money. But it makes life very easy because you can't, a SEP IRA, I think the real name of it is Simplified Employee Pension. That money then is going into a pension for the employee. 
then I can do other things. I can also do Roth IRAs. I can do stocks. I, but you know, the corporation can do lots of things. Did your business manager set all this up for you? And do they maintain all this? Yes. And are they the one that told you to do it? I don't remember who told me to do it. I honestly don't. Okay. So if you come in and work for me for a week doing whatever, and you're not on a union contract, um, so you're in my office, then I, I pay you on a W-2. Which is like gold for the entertainment industry, in my opinion. <laughs> because 1099s are very difficult. So there's W-2 and 1099s. 1099, I give you $100 and off you go. We submit that at the end of the year. A W-2, you made $100. I now have to take all the taxes out. So you end up with 72.33 or whatever it is. And then we send the rest to the government. So a 1099, the, gov the federal government is pretty good about this. The New York state doesn't like 1099s. They want their tax money. So they're very strict about who can be on a 1099. So by law of the state of New York, if you are given direction as to what to do, you're an employee. I could tell you to go to Bush Gardens. I drew the light plot. Go to Bush Gardens, light the show. That would be a 1099 job. Go to Bush Gardens and in the opening number, make it pink and blue with purple backlight and turn the follow spot on. That's an employee. And the state of New York comes in and does my books every few years to find out who, if we have screwed up on 1099. I've worked in New York State for eight years, nine years. This summer was the first time I ran into that situation, but I work for a summer camp. This year they went virtual, so I was out of a job. One of the acting teachers reached out to me and said, hey, I, you know, I'm on unemployment, but I'm going to take this job at this summer camp virtually. How is this going to affect my unemployment, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I always get paid on a 1099 when I go do that work. She said, well, they want to put me on a W-2. And I said, well, just ask if you can be on a 1099. And so she did. And she came back and she said, well, they said I have to be W-2 because they're telling me how to teach the class. Whereas when I go light the camp, they don't tell me how to do it. They just hire me to do the lighting. So this is a thing. <laughs> yes. And they're very strict about it. They've rejected a lot of people we've had on 1099s that I sent to a theme park for a week didn't tell them what to do, send them to the theme park for a week. They refused to accept them as 1099s. What has been the worst financial decision that you've ever made? Oh, not to pay the taxes. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> that was easy. No. <laughs> that was a decision that you made by just being busy. So it's not like you consciously... By just by working too much and, and not taking the reality as, you know, I'm in show business. Let's underline the business part. The show part is the fun part. The business part is the reality. But but this reality, I will say, you're very good with this reality, but you also have a business manager. Yes. You're also very good at the show part, and I would argue more good at the show part. The business part, you have help right. with somebody who does that for their full life. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. You don't think of retirement when you're 20 years old. You probably don't even think of it when you're 40 years old. Maybe when you're in your 50s, you start saying, oh, I, you know, a lot of people do think of retirement. Think of somebody who has a nine to five job, teaching school or working in a factory, a, a good job, a real job. They like their job, but what they're looking forward to is when that job is over and being able to relax and not have to go to work every morning. I'm going to travel, I'm going to camp, I, whatever it is. And everyone's different. That's sort of the way we've been taught. Working in entertainment, you are a freelance person. You don't know if you're going to work next Wednesday, next year or not. You really don't. You have to think about everything ahead of you. Retirement probably isn't something you want to do because we have all that free time. I happen to be lighting a show in Madrid. I can go to the museum. Madrid isn't on my bucket list because I've worked there. Going to Disneyland isn't on my bucket list because I go to California so much, I went to Disneyland. And if you have a family, you know, the family can come out the week after the show and go to Disneyland with you. You know, we thought about retirement. And when I started the corporation, we really did start putting money aside for pensions, lost all of it in 2008, but whatever that was, a lot of it. The United Scenic Artists has a pension plan. 
By the way, if you're a stagehand, if you're in a union, there is probably a pension plan. Uh, if you're an actor's equity, there's a pension plan. Now, you have to work a certain amount of time to be vested in the pension plan, which means you get money when you're old enough to get it. That's like forced savings that you don't see. So when I do a contract, and I just do a project-only contract, it's a 20% is pension welfare, welfare being health insurance. I don't see that. That comes out of the producer's pocket. doesn't come out of my pocket. That, that's all very good. It was just back here, back in my head, I'm saying, you know, at some point I might not work. It might be I don't want to work. I could have a health issue. Nobody could want me anymore. I mean, there's lots of things that could make you not work. So what are you going to live on? When I was working and working well and making money, I was saving. By the way, I've continued to work and I'm healthy. So um, it all sort of paid off. But, you know, and I also think you have to save something on everything. If you get $100, you've got to put some of it away. During this time, for this nine months or 10 months, whatever we've been in all this, I have talked to some friends that I'm worried about and said, are you okay? And they said, no, no, we have always saved a little money every year. We have enough money to get through a couple of years. And, and these are people, I would say, in their 40s. People in the 30s are going through their savings, but they put a little bit, even though it wasn't a lot, you put it aside. The rainy day fund, not the buy the new coat fund, it's the rainy day fund, which is your retirement. That's a really good point because we did like a Instagram live and it was about freelancer financial goals for 2021. That was the thing I was talking about. Figure out your plan for the year. Because a big thing for me is automate savings. For myself, it's very important that I automate. If I say to myself, okay, three times during the year when I get good paychecks, I'll put a big chunk of that into retirement. That doesn't work for me. I say I'm going to automate a small amount that I'm never going to withdraw over overdraw. I know a lot of my peers are really worried about the automating because they don't want to overdraw their account. And so what you said is, if you just take a little bit of everything you get, you don't have to think about it. So if you just make a rule for yourself, 10, 15% of every check, no matter how big, no matter how small, that's a way that your brain doesn't have to think about it. And, and the way I, you know, royalty checks, um, lucky enough to get royalty checks, I must say, I never think of royalty checks as it's income, but it, I don't count on it. You know, because shows close or shows are flops or whatever happens, you know. And now I'm lucky I work in a, at a level where I get royalty checks. If you're working in regional theater, you're not getting royalty checks. If you're doing national tours or Broadway or things, you're getting a royalty check. I um, never plan on the royalty check to run my business and to pay me. Yes, that money comes in. That money is basically invested. I don't, I don't live on royalty checks. I bought my house on royalty checks. Royalty checks can be lucrative. You know, the one thing I, I designed Chicago, it opened 24 years ago, up through March 8th or 10th or whatever it is. Every week for 23 years, I got a check from Chicago, New York. Every week. If it was selling out, it was a bigger check than if it was not doing great business that week. Now, there's a minimum amount that the royalty has to be that the union sets. Everything above that is something else. But, you know, that's Chicago. Now, you add that up to the, I can't even tell you how many companies we've done. But, you know, at times there are five or six checks a week coming in from Chicago. And then the other shows I've done, and I've always had shows on the road, bus trucks of things you didn't know I designed. You know, that a tour of 42nd Street, a tour of 9 to 5, a tour of whatever that is sending money every week. And then you get a few shows running and then actually, oh, I got a dozen checks this week, royalty check. Didn't plan on that because, oh, this week's 12, next week it's 10 because two of them are on layoff. You know, so you don't know, or that one closed, so this moves down. Or, so I can't count on that. That is, please God, I should be so lucky. And by the way, I hope everybody listening to this as a hit show like Chicago and get to check every week because bravo, it's one of the joys. And by the way, with my hundred Broadway shows, that's the biggest hit I've ever had. I mean, Sweeney Todd ran two years, but I think I never made money on those two years. I've had other shows that have done very well, but, uh, you know, and I've had subsequent companies and I've done well with them, but nothing like 
the money that comes in from Chicago. Old Reliable, we'll call it. But Old Reliable will close someday. Every show closes. Someday. And Mean Girls just closed. Threw in the towel. My front door won't be pink anymore at the office because Mean Girls in the same building. You've, you've sort of painted a complicated picture of your retirement savings. So I'm just going to ask these, just all these questions and, and you can say if you have it or don't have it. Do you have an IRA? Uh, I have a Roth and a SEP. I assume your business manager told you to set all these up. I have a financial advisor too, a retirement financial advisor who's done all of this. Okay, so your your IRA, your Roth IRA set up for you, Ken Billington. Your SEP IRA, is that set up through your business or is that set up through like a financial institution? It's a business that pays into the retirement, to wherever we have the money. Um, and then do you have a 401k? No. The people you pay on W-2s, do any of them have a 401k? I don't go into that. I don't go into that with them. Okay, then pension. Is your SEP your pension? Well, I have two pensions. So I have my United Scenic Artist pension. And then I have my pension, basically, which is my retirement savings. I think of that as a pension. It's my retirement savings. So in fact, I have one pension, which is from the United Scenic Artist. The rest is my retirement savings. Are you getting your pension currently from United Scenic Artists? Yes, I am. I'm over 70, so you have to take it. You have to take Social Security and you have to take your pension when you're over 70. And, oh, annuity. Do you have any annuities? There is some annuity built into my retirement savings. Got it. Okay. Life insurance, you said you had that. Do you still have that? No, I got rid of it because I don't have a family. I don't have a partner. I don't have children. What is the life insurance for? And a life insurance doesn't pay very well. So I cashed it in, took the cash, and put it into my retirement savings. But you you have a partner, so maybe you need life insurance, and someday you may have children. That's what life insurance is for. The United Scenic Artists has life insurance, so there's $10,000. That would basically cover your funeral. A health savings account, do you have one of those? It's all through the union now. And the, yeah, I was going to say, th those are a sort of a new thing. Yeah, I'm old enough to be on Medicare but I don't use it because I have better health insurance through the union. I am still working. That is being paid and covers everything. And when you turn 65, you have to take Medicare Part A. You have to. That's the law. That's basically hospitalization. You don't have to take Part B. Uh, and there is a great Social Security office right next to the Ritz Theater. No, it's not the Ritz. Walter Kerr Theater used to be the Ritz Theater. Uh, the Walter Kerr Theater, there's a Social Security office there, two blocks from my office. And you go in there, they're really lovely. They tell you everything you need to know. When I went in there, I had a new girl. She couldn't figure out how not to give me part B. And somebody from another cubicle said, think of him as an actor. <laughs> they totally got it. Yeah, I realized that's that I can't believe I don't actually have this, that on this list is Social Security. So you're taking Social Security now. Yeah, I have to. By the way, when you're 70, you have to take it. You can take it at 62. Not very much. A lot more when you're 70. But it's your money. You put it in there. Um, when did you start taking it? Did you wait as long as possible? Yeah, I took it when I was 70. I didn't need it before that. I get the maximum amount you can get. Cool. Okay. And then outside of retirement, do you invest in anything at all? No. It's, it's, uh, all my money is in uh, with that financial advisor and retirement accounts. And I have my house and all the property around it, which I've bought over the years. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we answered this with Chicago already, but what job of yours has been the most financially lucrative? It's Chicago. Clearly Chicago. Um other shows do very well. You know, when I do um, spectaculars, they pay very well. Things that you're not going to get royalties for. They pay well. A, a Dixie Stampede or a Fantasmic or a something that you don't even know is somebody's lit. They pay well. They pay very well. But it's a one-time payment. Yep. How much of your success has been hard work versus luck? Is it all luck? You know, I don't know. It's, uh, I think half of what we do is being in the right place at the right time and, and returning the phone calls and returning the emails and going out, seeing people. 
I'm always been a social person, not lately, but I've always been a social person. So I go to the theater. I go out to dinner in the theater district. I, I don't sit home and read my book. I go off and I do stuff. Walking out of Joe Allen's one day, I stopped to say hello to a producer who was with an author. I knew both of them. They said, oh, hi, Ken. I said, hi, how are you? And they said, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm doing X. They said, oh, I'm going to send you a script tomorrow uh, that this fellow wrote. Take a look at it. We're going to be doing that show in the spring. Maybe you'd be interested. I said, oh, okay. And the script shows up the next day. Now, it wasn't that they didn't think of me. They hadn't gotten to lighting yet. They probably would eventually and maybe have called me, but they saw me, they thought of me, they sent me the script and I lit the show. Also, be a pleasant person. Nobody wants anyone grumpy around. Nobody wants anyone temperamental around. They want team players around. Nobody wants you crying at the production table. Nobody wants you throwing the production table over. They want you to come in, do your job and be fun and have a good time. You can be serious. Obviously, it's serious business and you can focus on what you're doing, but they don't want drama from the lighting department. They sure don't want drama. The producer or the director has enough problems because the director is in charge of everything. So he or she understands that this is a problem, but we just got to solve it, move on, and let's figure it out next Wednesday when we have time. So Part of a career is being talented. Is that even the most important part? I don't know. Is being a good person that is fun to be around with, that does a good job and makes it easy. And if you do art at the same time, that's better. You're saying it so simply, but I think you're really hitting on all the important things about having a successful career. And the thing about going out and about, I think that's important because I'm very introverted. And I stick to myself. I, I work on so many shows and then people have no idea that I worked on the show because I'm just so to myself. That hurts me. And I'm and I'm aware of that. And it's something I try to work on. It's like, go be social. Go talk to people. Because if you don't exist, then you don't exist. Right. Yeah, no. Talk to the actors. Talk to the stagehands. Talk to, you know, I always say to the folks that are my assistants and associates, you can always go to dinner with me. That's not a problem. But maybe you should go to dinner with a design, the scenic design assistant or the costume design assistant or the costume designer. You're not a costume designer, but, you know, it's expanding that world because how you're going to get your next job as a designer is the scenic design assistant from the show you were just on that you had a relationship with. It may be a show relationship that, you know, you were pals while you were doing the show. And then next time you see each other, you'll still be pals. But they get a call to do something and they say, we don't have anybody in light. And they said, wait a minute. Oh, how about calling this person? And all of a sudden you get a phone call because you did a show together and you had dinner and drinks. And it's the entire room. You know, I hang out with everybody. I go with everyone. I think all those points you just made in the last five minutes, everybody should rewind five minutes and listen again. Right. <laughs> because I think, I think that really, I think that is so key. Yeah. I think it really is so key. Heading to a little bit of a wrap up. Um, if money was not an issue, what would your life's goal be? I would probably be doing what I do. I'm an artist. You know, at the end of the day, I'm an artist. When an artist hits retirement age, do they stop painting? Do they stop drawing? Do they stop sculpting? No, they just do it. They may do it on their schedule then. If I won the lottery tomorrow morning, I would probably still be doing the exact same thing I'm doing now. I would probably help my friends that are in uh, financial need at the moment. What financial advice would you give yourself back when you started your career? Or would you give a lighting designer that's just starting out right now? Early on, you got to take all jobs for free because you need people to know who you are. Free to me means car fare. At some point, you have to say, I now need to be paid because now that's my worth. I know we started in this basement and we got this show on for free and we did it and that was good. But the next one, I need to be paid. Maybe it's $300, but then you have now have worth for yourself. Somebody is hiring you to be a professional designer. You can always help your friends out. 
you know, when you're young, you can go help them hang the lights. But if the guy next to him is being paid to hang lights, then you should be paid to hang lights. What can you and I do to stress the importance of finance and savings and business to our fellow artists? I think this moment that we are living in is very important because if you save some money before March, it may be getting you through. If you hadn't saved money before March, you were wildly stressed now. If you had saved something, then this is a perfect example. Let's say you don't save anything and you're 65 and nobody calls you to work again. Hello, here we are. Exactly what's going on right now. You're not working. Final two questions here. What separates those that have a full-time career in the arts, like you do, from those people that never try to go into the arts or maybe start and then transition to something else? I think if you're going into the arts, you can never be sure of employment. You really can never be sure of it. Even if you're the artistic director of the theater, that may all end next Wednesday. <clears throat> Nothing is certain at all. Some people don't deal with that well. They can't function if they don't know they're going to make X amount of dollars this year. Uh, and some people want their two-week vacation on the first week of June every year because whatever. And that's certain people, and that's fine. That's all good. This is a rough business. So if you have to have security, this is not the place where a lot of security comes from. Even if you're a stagehand, and not even if you're a stagehand, if you're a stagehand, you might not be working next week because your show will close. So you don't know if you are the treasurer at the box office, same thing. If you are the company manager, same thing. If you're the director, same thing. Of all of what we do in the arts, none of this is full time. It might be. It might be for many years. It might be for career. Yes, people that are in Phantom of the Opera since it opened, they've been doing one job for 38 years. That's the same as um, a full-time job. But you don't know that. Some people aren't cut out for that. And I admire a great deal people that realize at some point that they can't do this and go and do something else. Or somebody who's been doing it for 20 years changes their career. I admire that more than anything because they figured out what's going to make them happy and what their lives should be. And that's good. And, but you, I think you should try. It's easy to try when you're 20. As I say, when you're 20 years old, you can sleep on a futon and not think anything's wrong with it. When you're 35, sleeping on a futon is not so good. You want a mattress. And when you're 45, you want a good bed. And, and that's it. So when you're 25, you, it, it, you can scrap. Yeah, I'll eat at McDonald's. I don't care. So I think when you're younger, you can fight harder. But if, if there's things that make you unhappy, you're going to have to probably move on as opposed to being unhappy for the rest of your life because nobody wants an unhappy person around them. <laughs> okay, that's great. Ken, where can people find out more about you? Well, KenBillington.com has my resume and Wikipedia, I guess, you know, whatever. Um, well, Ken, thank you so much for sitting and chatting with us. This was awesome. Oh, thanks. It was uh, really good. That was our interview with Ken Billington. My takeaways were pay your taxes. Ken ran the experiment of not paying for three years. While he survived, it wasn't pretty. Pay as you go will help you avoid a giant back payment plus penalties and interest. Don't have debt. Easier said than done, but it has served Ken well. Hire a business manager. You're an artist and want to create, but you are also a business. So pay someone to make sure you're taking care of the business properly so you can be creative without worry. And finally, be social. This is necessary for getting work. And to introverts like me, I know this part of the business is difficult. I don't have time to cover it today, but if you're introverted like me and have trouble being social, email me at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com and I'll share my workaround for being a social introvert. Now remember your homework to make sure you decide how much you're putting into your retirement account, make a schedule for depositing the money, and decide what index funds you're investing in. No one is going to check that you've done your homework so you have to do it for yourself. 
If you want to hear the outtakes about Ken's training in New York, his opinion on the Spider-Man musical, and the lesson he learned from Theron Musser, you can find those over at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Now, I find the conversation valuable to young designers. My free offer always stands. If you want to hear the outtakes, but you don't want to commit to being a patron, email me and I'll send you the audio directly. One favor before we end today. Please recommend Artistic Finance to someone. They might not decide to dive into organizing their financial life, but even hearing some of these stories will get their mind thinking about simple financial steps that they can do for themselves. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steimel. Producing consultant Anne Nygren Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. Music by Chong Liu.